And another week is underway on BetUS TV's College Basketball Show. Good to be back with you. I am merely the somewhat capable host, TJ Reeves. We say hello to our handicappers to get ready to get things started for a brand new week in February. Those are Corby Craig and Matty Cox. Boys, good to be back with you off of a weekend that saw a lot of wild action. You can talk about statement wins all over college basketball. How big of a statement win for Kansas over Houston at home? How about Tennessee at Rupp against Kentucky? How about North Carolina says to Duke? Put up your Dukes and punched them right in the snout in game number one of those two matchups that always, always deliver. Uh, St. Mary's goes in and wins in Gonzaga, uh, in Spokane. So, guys, there, there is a bunch to go over from the weekend, and then we look ahead to Monday and get ready to handicap. Matty Cox, you first. Hello. How are things? Uh, and what about the weekend? Yeah, heavy weekend. Great action. Uh, slate of the year, some are saying. I think my takeaways were right on cue with what you tease there. UK and KU, uh, the Jayhawks, which we'll discuss here shortly, a quick turnaround to play their arch rival in state at the Octagon of Doom. But they got it done at the Fog, maybe the creme de la creme of home court environments, and they propelled KU to play out of their minds. They certainly shot out of their minds, uh, handled Houston wire to wire. Very impressive. But then UK, Kentucky, on the other hand, could not handle anything defensively. Um, I think it's a real problem emerging for as much as we love all the individual talent that John Calipari has. There's some real upside there for sure. Defensively, uh, they are a major work in progress. Might even be too kind to say what they are right now. So um, Kentucky overs might be an angle we could continue to write on this show. True. I mean, they gave up another 90 plus points in the loss to Tennessee. Corby Craig, thoughts on the weekend on any of that or anything else that stood out, including Purdue winning a big one at Wisconsin uh, yesterday, Illinois had to have overtime with Nebraska. Lucky to escape, blew a 10-point lead Sunday night late in the game. Nebraska got it into overtime, but Illinois won it in overtime. So a little Big Ten talk there. Any other thoughts, Corby, off the weekend, my friend? Yeah, Kentucky is, is an issue. It's weird to see Tennessee kind of playing this fast pace. Like we saw a Tennessee team that was in the 120s last year, basically, uh, for the national average of points in the game. And now they scored 100 in a game. Pretty handily. So uh, good to see Tennessee at least have some offense. I'm, I, I'm curious if this is a Tennessee team that has the ability to go kind of deep into March now. Like this, their their issue always was the inability to score points. Uh, but other than that, uh, the team we talked about a million times, High Point, is the nation's longest active win streak now. So that's always fun to watch. I still worry about their ability to go deep into March just because I, I don't think they play enough defense. Uh, but the offense, man, it's so fun to watch. And then the, uh, the last thing is, I will say they, they they lost on Sunday, but the UAB Blazers are cleaning it up, TJ. Beat your uh, Memphis Tigers. They they looked good versus SMU. They beat North Texas. Both of those is eight-point dogs. So um, I, I have been cr- a critic at times and, and would like to say they, uh, they've, they've definitely cleaned it up with the talent they have. How about Memphis uh, struggled the entire game, beat Wichita State on a last-second shot. Uh, Matt Cox, to your point, Memphis and Kentucky should compare defense – disasters right now on who on, on which one is the bigger disaster uh yet memphis gets the win still you've got south florida usf that wins at north texas on the weekend you mentioned uab we mentioned smu how about charlotte is eight and one in this conference so you like go below florida atlantic and you can make a case for about five or six teams right guys matt cox they thought you can make a case for about five or six teams that could be the second team to come out of this uh, conference, maybe win the conference tournament as well when it comes up in Fort Worth. Yeah, I should get my patriotic uh, tattoo out or something. I've been beating the American drum all year. I think this league's really good. Obviously, Memphis was supposed to be one of the heavy hitters, and it's hard to say that they're at that level right now. Uh, What they've looked like since getting Daquan Tomlin, I think that was sort of a too big of a system shock too late in the year, in my not-so-humble opinion. But yeah, this league is loaded with good teams, right? I mean, I think Tulsa, ECU, Tulane, North Texas, UAB, right in the thick of the standings. Um, even Wichita at one and eight. Even Temple at one and eight, who's been kind of the, uh, you know, the the, the bottom, the, the cellar dweller, if you will, this season. They just took Tulane to overtime last night. Now a disgusting non-cover. If you took uh, took ten and a half there, lost the overtime by twelve. But yeah, there's are there's no good, uh, no easy, easy outs in that league. So I mean, right. FAU will be tested all year long. Charlotte and USF. And Charlotte's been the darling all year, right? Charlotte, USF is Tuesday night for the Tuesday show. Mountain West, real quick, San Diego State won uh, on the weekend over Utah State. Uh, again, Boise State, New Mexico in this league, Colorado State, uh, Nevada. Very deep league, deeper than what the Pac-12 looks like. 
uh, for right now. So some good conversation off the weekend. So let's take a look at the records. We had a rough Friday. We went 0-2 on Friday with the Big Ten and with the Ivy League play. But we're still above 500 beginning a new week. It's all about the future. All about the future, Savages. We're looking ahead to Monday and what's going to be taking place today and to get things rolling. Let's do so in the ACC. Let's begin with a matchup with Miami, a winner over the weekend, and Virginia. Virginia suddenly has put some things together, beating Clemson on the weekend. Now these two come right back on Monday night and square off in Charlottesville. Cavaliers favored by six, 132 and a half is our total. Matt Cox, begin the discussion here on this one in the ACC. These are a couple of teams right now, especially Miami probably on the outside looking in. Virginia probably in at the moment, but it would be a, it would be a large win for Miami if they can get it. Thoughts on Miami and Virginia? Yeah, Virginia playing much better. I mean, no question about it. I've been sort of a doubter all season. Just don't really see a ton of offensive upside with this team. Uh, but they're kind of starting to get back to the Tony Bennett model and blueprint of what works, right? They're playing good defense. Uh, they're protecting the rim, and they have some good individual defenders. Uh, Jordan Miner, the transfer from Merrimack, who was a real disappointment to start the season. He's really coming to his own the last few games, helping propel this run. Tough matchup, I think, though, with Miami U, right? If you want to loosen up that pack line defense, you have to, to make shots from the outside. If you watch Miami play over the weekend against Virginia Tech, they didn't look very good in the first half. But we know they can shoot it, and they can shoot it from 30 feet out. Nigel Pack, Keyshawn George, um, Ugo Papa, these guys have no range, right? Their, their range knows no bounds. I think that's sort of a good uh, kryptonite to UVA's structural defensive tendencies. And at six points, I know Fane UVA on the road is not a great investment proposal, but I think this number's gotten a little too big. Market liked UVA at the opener at four. I kind of like the Canes here at six, but no official play for me, TJ. Corby, it's a Virginia team that always seems to find its legs like in February. And lo and behold, uh, look here. They've won six games in a row. Again, they beat Clemson. They, the wins over Notre Dame and Louisville don't mean much right before that, but also a win over NC State. Uh, they won at Georgia Tech. They've won it against Virginia Tech. All right, what about Virginia at home, including a thought on the total for this one tonight? Yeah, I've been impressed with Virginia's defense as of late, uh, but I do kind of agree. Like This is a Miami team that doesn't run. Like, I, I think when you struggle versus Virginia, it's when you get into sets and you're trying to beat a defense with a drawn-up offense. That's not what Miami is. Miami is uh, a bunch of good individual athletes. They get down the court fast, don't let your defense set up. Uh, and, and getting Matthew Cleveland back last game is going to really help that. They, uh, they lost basically their best player. Um, so the last few games kind of have been a downfall of Miami. And I don't really think it's due to their demise by any means they have they have enough guard play to uh shoot through this as matt kind of talked about uh the one thing that's been like a upsetting to me is i talked about in the preseason show andrew Rody for virginia i i really thought andrew Rody would be a, an a, an impressive add to a virginia team who has had such a p short point guard for so many years bring in a 6-6 point guard uh, who can facilitate but he just really hasn't done anything so i still think they have upside uh jordan miners get a lot of playing time because bond got hurt Bond was really just a defender. He couldn't really score the basketball. Jordan Miner, um, I, I think, has all the intangibles. So an over wouldn't surprise me uh, by any means, but I don't want to be here and, and bet on a Virginia over any day of the week. So I, I would take the points with Miami. Uh, I, I feel pretty fine in the idea that I, I think they're the more talented team on the court, uh, and I'm not too worried about the home court advantage on a Monday here. I, I give Virginia some credit towards the home court, but uh, not as much as probably most do couple of veteran coaches, too. Jim Laranega's been at it for a long time, had Miami in the Final Four last year, of course. Let us not forget, Tony Bennett led Virginia to the National Championship 2019, the year after they lost to a 16 seed. They turned around and won the national title. ACC Showdown, ESPN, 7 p.m. tonight in the John Paul Jones Arena. Good discussion here from the guys on Virginia and Miami. Again, thank you for finding us. We're here Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Hit that like button down below. Make sure you are subscribed. Uh, great stuff. Always coming your way, talking college basketball from here through March and all the way through the Final Four. All right, uh, game number two, Grambling and Alcorn State. Uh, frequently on Monday, we talk SWAC, we talk MEAC that's on the schedule. This one has Alcorn State favored by three at home with a total of 135 and a half. Corby, I am back to you. You're going to have an official play on this game. Why is this one on your slate for tonight? Yeah, I've done this for basically the last four weeks, but I took a grambling over here. I, I got 135 and a half. I haven't checked because we've been on the show, but it was looking like it was going to steam up. So I think you're going to get a little worse number. I like to this up to 37. So uh, I think you should be plenty fine if you're watching live. Sorry, I'm not in the chats today, so I can't 
see what everybody's getting. But uh, pretty simple. We talked about Jordan Miner looking like uh, he, he couldn't find his own, and, and he has now at Virginia. It's great. And I think Grambling has a piece just like that. Jalen Johnson, center from Alabama A&M for the past few years. If you've watched Alabama A&M games, like, he has some pretty good moves in the, in the low post. He is starting to get more playing time. He's the MVP, quote-unquote, by Ken Palm in the last matchup. And it finally gives them a piece after they haven't had all year in the post. So uh, Grambling's offense, if you've watched, is basically – a, a really ugly attempted at offense, and then it's just guards driving to the basket and get to the free throw line. They really didn't have a, a center who would control any pace of the game, and now they have it with Jalen Johnson. He 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 has scoring potential, uh, and I think this is an Alcorn team that has been slowed down just due to the lack of talent. But in years past, we've seen them want to play fast. They had a total of versus UAB of 156. So to get a 135, uh, these are your Grambling teams that I always go over. Also, uh, I bet the Grambling over who did they play last Monday? You did hit Friday. it they last played, Monday. I just uh, looked. Arkansas yes. Pine Bluff. So Correct. We, on the show we did Arkansas Pine Bluff, they were down 16 um, with, like I think, 45 seconds left. And I talked about it on that show, and I'll talk about it on the show again. Down 16 with 45 seconds left. They were continuing to foul to try to win that game. And that is <laughs> what you want uh, from a team that you're betting over. So <laughs> the team doesn't get give over, up, right. even when they should. Uh, and I will take it over because of that. The uh, the chat is saying they're seeing 137 or 136 and a half. And again, yeah. we make mention here that with all the great work our people do behind the scenes on BetUS TV, I often joke, this is not the McDonald's drive through kids. It, you don't order it up and it's there in two minutes, allegedly. You know, sometimes I have to pull over to the side into one of those curbside spots and then they bring me my food. But in any event, this gets done about an hour hour uh, 15, something like that before the show where the graphics are getting loaded in and the price is the price at that point, which is what you're going to see on our crawl down below, what you're going to see, et cetera. So in this case, you're getting a little better number, but it evens out because there are times when we're getting a worse number when the line moves against you, right, on an official play that we make. Corby, just one more thought. Yeah, and I'm I'm super against playing something like sharing a number that I don't believe has value anymore. We've done it a few times on the show, but like I think 37 is fine. So uh, if I didn't like 37, we would have nixed this play from the show. But right. uh, if you're getting 137, I think you're good. Uh, Matt Cox, a thought or two on this one again. Alcorn here at home. It's kind of obscure. I don't know how much you have on this. The chat loves Alcorn State tonight for whatever it's worth on the side. Matty Cox, go ahead. Yeah, playing much better uh, recently. Just come off a tough home loss at home to Southern, uh, staying here at home, Grambling having to make the quick road trip over. So I think, you know, sidewise, I do like the spot, um, but I don't think I'd be rushing to back them just because Grambling's been pretty good too, right? I think we're seeing a lot of these SWAC teams kind of trend back to where the preseason prognostications had them. Now, there's no consistency in SWAC preseason prognostications at all, but at least from the work that we did at the Almanac and some other reputable sources, it seems like you're starting to see the teams that we thought would emerge are emerging, and the teams that were not very good kind of started to trickle toward the bottom of the barrel. Tough to make any sense of anything until you get to January. Now with a month of sample, uh, you know, I think you kind of stick to what you – stick to your guns, I guess, is my recommendation if you looked at any of these teams preseason into how you're looking to bet going forward from a sides perspective. But nothing on the total. That's, that's, uh, that's Corby's – Corby's area of expertise. It is. Uh, several people in the chat are saying, hey, they still like it at 137. Corby's saying, hey, for the show purposes, an hour or so ago, he locked in at the over of 135 and a half for Grambling and Alcorn State. That one coming up tonight at 7 uh, 30 local time in Lorman, Mississippi, 8 30 Eastern time this evening. All right, let's move on. Shall we go west? Let's go west, gentlemen. Let's go all the way west to Sacramento, California. Idaho and Sacramento State in the big sky coming up on a Monday. Sacramento State favored by four and a half. Our total is 132. Matt Cox begins some discussion here on this one. These two teams with losing records in the big sky. But uh, this one on a Monday night, what uh, what stands out, if anything, from a handicapping standpoint? Yep, of the two, I'm sorry, of the four main board games tonight, there's two in the big sky, and they both have a tricky, tricky spot for the road teams. We have third game in five days, and both of those teams playing their third game in the fifth day will be traveling. Uh, in this case, Idaho is in the tough spot. We'll get to Eastern Washington, Portland State in a second. But uh, Alex Pribble, head coach of Idaho, talked about how he was looking ahead to this as a potential uh, you know, wear and tear, fatigue, letdown spot coming off their really impressive performances over the weekend, right? They went to both Montana schools and played very well. Now they have to go to Sacramento under David Patrick, who's been, you know, I think underwhelmed this year, but the team's playing better. Uh, they're physical up front. They can grind the game out. I think they'll actually be a, 
uh, a tough game for Idaho to keep up in. It won't be a high-scoring game, but I think they're going to start to see some cracks late in the game. I was looking at Sacramento State. I just don't know if I can trust um, this team to lay four and a half. The market bet this up from four, four and a half. I mean, look at their last few weeks, their last you know, almost two months of results. They've not been anybody by more than two points. I mean, they've won some close games. They've beaten some good teams. But just seems that the way they play, it's impossible for them to really extend even beyond four and a half points. And a game with a total that's sitting at 132, which almost feels too high to me, to be honest, um, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to lay the four and a half. But I would lean toward the Hornets just based on the spot here, TJ. Uh, Corby Craig, it's an Idaho Vandals team as... Matt mentioned that did beat Montana State. That snapped an eight-game losing streak for them. But previous to the eight-game losing streak, guess, guess who they defeated at home? Sacramento State. So this is a rematch. Thoughts on this one tonight now on the road for Idaho? Yeah, two pretty bad teams defensively. Uh, interesting. My my number actually wanted me to bet the over. Uh, I don't think that it had diagnosed the situation as much as it probably should have. Idaho in, in a really tough spot. Sac State's going to have the ability to make this pace their own. Usually you kind of take a blend or an average of like who, who you think is going to be able to set the pace. And I think pretty handily it's Sac State here. So laid off the total. I made it 135, which just is not fun to think about and by any means. Uh, I, I have watched a few Sac State games, and I will say I think that they draw fouls a lot better than they actually get whistles for. Like if you watch them play, most of their offense is set up uh, for a point guard to go downhill uh, and get to the line, but they just haven't gotten calls. And, and when they do, uh, just had it in front of me, but I think their point guard was shooting at like an 85% free throw rate. So uh, 80% at this point. Early in the season, he was like 85% free throw rate. Uh, and and I, I think they're plenty fine in getting into the basket. Idaho, uh, if they're going to be sleepy, it's going to be on the defensive end. A lot of people talk about like situational spots um, being tough to score points, but I, I think that if you're tired, it shows more on the defensive end of the court. So uh, okay. I could see Idaho with some bum fouls here. It would be Sac State or nothing for me. Matt kind of hit it nail on head. Like this is a team that's tough to back two possessions or more. Uh, but man, I, I was really close. My number leaning over, uh, it means favorite or nothing for me. So with Lane Sac State, lay completely low on this game though. Excuse me, I was putting the great nugget out. They play in the nest. I don't know how many people know that. I didn't know that. Six Pacific time, nine Eastern time, Sacramento State rematch with Idaho State. No official play from the guys here. We gave you some good discussion, and we got another Big Sky game coming up. Slightly more interest, though, in the next game. That is Kansas and Kansas State. Let's take a look at what we have tonight with Kansas off the win over Houston. Kansas State really struggling right now, even though it's at home. The Jayhawks are four-and-a-half-point favorites. The total 144 and a half. Corby Craig, I'm coming right back to you here. Kansas, arguably their most impressive performance of the year. They tried to let Houston back in the game, like in the final three or four minutes before they put it away. But really for about 35 minutes of that game, they were really good against one of the best teams in the country. All right, now turn right around on about 52 hours notice here and play their rival who's been struggling, who's been hurting. Corby, any thoughts here on this one tonight with Kansas, Kansas State? Total is what, at 145 and a half is, the, is what I think I see on the bet U.S. line there. All right, thoughts, Corby, to begin the discussion. Yeah, first off, I, I think this total is way too high. I, I've bet Kansas State overs too much this year. It's not it's not a fun game to play. Tyler Perry, uh, a, a traditionally slow point guard just due to the nature of the offense that he was kind of grown up in. It looks like when he's in trouble when he faces presses or he faces any kind of late game situation, he wants to tend to go back to that uh, slow pace kind of basketball. And, and we've seen that a few times. Also, he's been really turnover prone. Like I have not been impressed by Tyler Perry at all. And, and a, a, a UAB kid, I have seen Tyler Perry hate game winners on seven foot Trey Jimson at UAB plenty of times at this point. Uh, I know he's a good basketball player, but it just doesn't seem like he's been able to step up to competition as much as I would like to have seen him step up. He missed two free throws um, to seal out a game a few weeks ago. And he's a 91% free throw shooter. So I think there's something to be said about, uh, I guess you could call it the yips of basketball. But uh, I do think in late game situations, he struggles. And, and there's not going to be a more stressful situation than playing Kansas here at home kind of helps. But um, yeah, he has some good games in his belt. But I, I think Kansas overall is the better team. Uh, they're going to be able to pressure most of this, I, I lean very heavy towards the under. I, I don't know what Matt would have made this number, but I was closer to like, I mean, the national average of points in the game is 140. I'm, 
I'm lower than national average for Kansas State, so I, I would have been at probably 139 and a half for this game. All right, interesting on the bet U.S. line. I may have said 145 and a half. We locked it in at 144 and a half to begin here at Showtime. May go up or down on this. What has happened to Kansas State? Matt Cox, if we had the answer, we could sell it to Jerome Tang maybe right now. His team was 3-1 and one in the Big 12. They've now lost four in a row. The four, though, are Iowa State, Houston, Oklahoma, and then they did lose at Oklahoma State on the weekend. What about their psyche, and how does that affect a handicap tonight with Kansas State at home? Yeah, very tricky handicap here, TJ. Um, it, it's a game that feels like it should be lower scoring, uh, but as TJ talked about, or sorry, Corby talked about, the, the over been bet up, and it's sitting at six points above, or sorry, five points above Ken Palm's projection, uh, despite the fact that you have Tyler Perry, who's been generally pretty prone to crawling and halting the tempo. You would think in a close game tonight, if they were able to keep it close against KU, it should play to a lower tempo. Um, that's where Tyler Perry's been at his best, lower tempo, high level situations, making tough shots in key moments. But you look at his numbers against the, the creme de la creme this season, it's not been good. Right? He was ineffective against Houston, ineffective against Iowa State. A little better the last two games, but those are both empty calorie results against Oklahoma State. He should have probably won that game, got beat by 20. Um, and then obviously to go on the road in a bounce back spot to not get a win over a bad Oklahoma State team. Just a lot of alarm bells ringing right now, in my opinion, for Kansas State. It's a home run spot for them catching Kansas off that, you know, monstrous effort against Houston, which Kansas made every shot under the sun. Um, but just right now, the way I've seen K-State, as Corby talked about, the concerns with Perry, they're also a little bit injured. A David and Gesson up front, a key defender for them. Um, is not 100%. I think he matters quite a bit here. It could be a bloodbath in the paint if Kansas can exploit that. And Perry going against Tyler, uh, I'm sorry, Dewan Harris, one of the best on-ball defenders in the country as well, pretty problematic. So uh, I was hoping to actually catch KU at the opening number. Um, I thought it dropped to three. We've seen some five. So some back-and-forth market tug-of-war here, uh, pretty interesting dissenting opinions on both sides. But ultimately, I'll be on the fence. Uh, hope we get a good basketball game. More points than... Um, some of these low, low, slow mos we've seen from K-State lately. What can we get that total at right now? Sorry. Uh, 144 and a half is what we see on the bet U.S. line for the show, yeah. for the purposes of the show. It goes to 145. I don't know what it currently is. Q&A, I don't know what... we'll bet it. Yeah, and, uh, and by the way, uh, several people in the live chat have been talking about the side and talking about grabbing Kansas State last night when it was six or five and a half, uh, down to four and a half now on the bet U.S. line for what it's worth. Bramlage Coliseum. This is the back end of the ESPN Monday night ACC Big 12 doubleheader uh, tonight known as the Octagon. They have pulled some upsets two or three times even in recent history against Kansas. This would be an upset if they catch Kansas off the Houston win. Let's see what it looks like tonight in the Big 12, eight local time, nine Eastern time. One more game that we're going to discuss uh, here and then we're going to get to your live Q&A. That game is back in the big sky, as Matt Cox alluded to. Second uh, big sky game that's on our discussion schedule. Eastern Washington and Portland State. And Eastern Washington comes in as a five and a half point road favorite with a total of 147 and a half. All right, Matt Cox, you're going to have an official play on this game. What uh, what drew you to this one? The last game of the night at seven local time, 10 Eastern time tonight in Portland. Yeah, stay up late for this one uh, or wake up tomorrow for a waking cake, as we call it, I suppose. But uh, this is, again, the second of those two big sky matchups where you have the third game in five days for the road team, in this case, Eastern Washington, who's been the class of the conference all season long, right? They've just looked like a juggernaut, a well-oiled machine. And both these teams actually profile very similarly. They have a lot of interchangeable positionless wings that create tough mismatches for other opponents. Now you pin them together. Um, we saw some of this in the first matchup, although Eastern Washington mopped the floor with Portland State coming off the Christmas break. So I don't really put a ton of stock in what I saw from Portland State's offense in that game. I think the Vikings score a lot more tonight. Um, I know they're going to be down one of their key guards and shooters and Ishmael Habib most likely, but I think there's enough other weapons, especially with K.J. Allen back in the mix, um, to really exploit some of the, uh, you know, the mismatches defensively that Eastern Washington, they don't have many, they are long, but I do think they have some soft spots, some vulnerable pieces defensively. Eastern Washington, I think, can flip that back on its head on the other side, too. All that is to say, I think there's a ton of points in this game. Efficiency should be through the roof. And the final kind of bonus edge I see here is Portland State recently has been pressing more. They've been trying to dial up some uh, tempo, uh, which is what they did last year under Jace Coburn. He talked about how, they're, how they've spotted some matchups 
in the schedule where they can bring that out to bear. I think this is one of those tonight. So you see a pretty uh, frenetic defensive attack from Portland State, which could actually open up more points for Eastern Washington and transition or generate quick points going the other way off of steals for Portland State. So I'm looking at this tempo projection from Ken Palm at 69. It's at 147 uh, in his book. The first game played 72 possessions this year. In last season, TJ, these two were absolute shootouts. Uh, we're looking at uh, 76 possessions in a 92-80 game, and then 79 mm -hmm. possessions, 98-88 to 88 in the rematch. So I think you get more of a repeat of those types of performances. Um, and again, shots are falling. I think this one sails over the total, so a rare over for me is my play today. Well, and again, give Eastern Washington credit because they had won, what, like 10 games in a row before the Montana State loss, including winning road games at Idaho, at Weber State, at Idaho State. So they lost the Montana State game what, last Thursday night, but then they beat Montana on the weekend. And as you mentioned, now third road game in four or five days here. All right, Corby, any thought on Eastern Washington? What kind of legs are they going to have, especially in the second half here at Portland State? Uh, any thoughts here, Corby? Yeah, my only real concern here was to be uh, his injury. I'm not sure how significant it was. Uh, he definitely has been out, and he is a guy who can, can facilitate and score his own. So can Portland State score? But this line kind of indicates that they can, even without him, uh, just being such a close number. I fully agree. I, I wouldn't be surprised if by game time I have bet this over with Matt. Uh, seeing 69 possessions in an Eastern Washington Portland State game is kind of crazy to think about like this is a game I made 73 possessions last year like, it's not even close to the deviation of what we've seen even in the last 16 months so I uh, don't really understand that possession by by old Ken Palm himself uh, the main thing for me here is if you go look at the first game like I don't think it was ever even a close enough game to be fast like Eastern Washington didn't hold the ball by any means but they were I mean they were mm -hmm. up 40 and uh, so I, I don't think they really tried to push pace and yet you see 72 possessions you see a game that really for the pace had not a lot of free throws 16 and i think it was 11 for portland state so the, in most cases in in these 72 73 possession games it's because there were fouls and it was able to turn the, the ball over to the other team and start a new possession um in, in a faster time frame so i i think this plays closer to 74 possessions and if that's the case like even if they don't have a beep and they don't have the scoring generation they usually have, I think it's in a pretty good spot at 148. Like this is still a, we talked about it's still not even that far over the national average points in a game. Like uh, we see 140 to 144 range pretty normalized, and yet two possessions in a game with two of the faster teams in the nation. I, I think it's a really good bet. All right, again, you make a good point. They did wipe out Portland State in the first meeting at home. That was back at the beginning of January. This is now the rematch. We got to work on the sponsor names in the big sky, boys, for the arenas. Uh, as we mentioned, Sacramento State plays in the nest. Hey, the Hornets' uh, nest. Portland That's State. perfect, baby. The Hornets' Hornet, nest is yes, perfect for the their Hornets' nest. nest. Portland State plays in the Viking Pavilion tonight. The Viking Pavilion has this one at seven local time, ten Eastern time on ESPN Plus. And for Matty Cox, he sees points and a lot of them over one forty-seven and a half in what is the last game of the night coming on. Monday. All right, we'll get to your live Q&A after we remind you we're here Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, all the way through March, all the way through the Final Four coming at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona. Make sure you are with us. Lots of great handicapping advice, official plays, and much more, the fun and the frivolity. I know some of you watch us later in the day. Watch us, you know, in the in the late afternoon or the early evening before the games. Be here live because you get live interaction Q&A. There are not a ton of games to obviously go over today. We might touch on a couple of Tuesday games and what the guys might think uh, are, are some of the lines. But, uh, again, be with us here. Hit that like button. Help us out. Share the show out as well. We see the subscriber count going way up. And we know the final NFL game, the, the Super Bowl being played this weekend, it's all about the college hoops from here on out till we get to March. So pump the subscriber list up, hit that like button, be with us here at 11 a.m. All right, uh, let's get into some live questions, and I think Corby's going to circle back to a live play coming up in a couple of moments. First, some live questions. Uh, M. Caesar is curious tomorrow about Kentucky and Vanderbilt in Nashville. M. Caesar says, what about the line? What do we make of Kentucky with a loss badly at South Carolina? a loss at home to Florida, a loss at home now to Tennessee. Kentucky's still going to be favored by a few, right, guys? Any any thought on that for the viewer? 
Yeah, it should be close to 10, um, maybe 8 to 10 in that range. Clearly, Vanderbilt at home it can be sort of a, a trap, as many SEC opponents have seen. Coming off a win against Missouri at home over the weekend, snapping a six- or seven-game losing streak for Stackhouse. Uh, not exactly a super impressive effort that it warrants some blue ribbon or anything, but I, I do think this is a close-ish game, and I don't see Kentucky solving their defensive issues, and they are major, major issues uh, on Sunday, Monday before they head to Nashville. So I, this, I think, is an area where Vanderbilt can actually score points, as basically every team has done against Kentucky this season. Um, again, over. You know, Ken Palm has this at 154. I think this is 160 easy. I'm sure market will adjust, as they have pretty heavily with a lot of the obvious total shades this season, but I think you'll be pretty safe with more runway for overs on Kentucky until their defensive lapses get solved. Corby, any thought there? I mean, Kentucky's been equal opportunity like Memphis on defense. Don't guard anybody right now. <laughs> any thought there? Yeah, the defense has been bad, but if you've watched this Vandy team, I just don't I don't think they have scores. Like, I don't care what you draw. I don't care who plays. Like, uh, Torres is probably their most true scorer, uh, and he's a freshman. Like, uh, granted, a, a freshman in this day and age, college basketball are a little different than they used to be. Appreciate the zoom in, Kevin. Uh, but Torres is a good <laughs> basketball player. Uh, obviously, I have a good point guard. But other than that, like I, I just haven't been impressed by the sets that they've run at all. Like We watched a San Fran game where they were absolutely lost behind the wheel by a San Fran team who like isn't talented by any like crazy metric. Uh, I think this will be the best team they've played. The only issue I have with betting this, I, I would link Kentucky. I, I would assume the number's probably 10. Uh, link Kentucky, but... Vandy kind of kept up with Tennessee there for a minute. Was Tennessee kind of sleeping through? Probably. Uh, yep. But I think that's the only game worth noting. So maybe a live bet, Kentucky, anything under six. But I, I feel fine that the Cats get it done here. All right. Elias watching us. Again, members get prioritized in the questions. Make sure you join up. It's a new month here in February. Questions get prioritized for the members. Elias watching says, Howard on the road with Delaware State. He's interested not only in the side, but the total of 142. Corby, I saw the smirk. Any thought? Not a not a lot of great games on Monday besides the ones we talked about. Any thought on that one? Yeah, I just love the uh, community that we've built on on Mondays to be able to sit here and talk about Howard versus Delaware State totals. Uh, it cracks me up. But And like in the chats before the day, they were like, uh, Grambling's on the show. Corby must have been over, which is just... Like, I couldn't tell you four players off Grambling, so it's funny to see. <clears throat> but, yeah, this is a Howard team that it's over or nothing. Like, uh, they don't play defense. They don't. They really don't play offense. It's just transition offense and ISO basketball, which is fun to watch. It's kind of like the North Carolina A&T team right now. Uh, but I, I, it would be over or nothing. The issue is, yeah, I mean, you've missed two and a half points, basically. It's open 140. I was going to bet the over at 140, 142 and a half. I'm kind of laying away from, uh, but I do think you're on the right track there. Good stuff. Anything, uh, Matt Cox, or you want to move on on Howard, Delaware State? Yeah, I see the underlying regression angle for over here, but, I mean, man, South Carolina State, I'm pretty familiar with this team. I've watched them a few times. Uh, they play a lot of junk zone, and their games tend to s settle in the 60s. So, um, you know, I know the predictive metrics sort of po point to this being an over type game, and certainly when you're dancing with Howard, it can go over, but just the way South Carolina has the ability to make these one-two possession games, and it ends up in a sludge in the 60s, I would tread lightly, I guess. All right. Corby has been anxious because you've been reviewing the over. And I, is the red button going to come out here? We're going to have a live play on the Monday Great show. Day, yeah. What? It, get it ready. Here we go. Live play coming from Corby Craig. Uh, Craig, a, a late ad here. What are you adding? What's up? Listen. Listen, TJ, I have, a, I have a couple of don'ts on this show. First, don't live bet anything. I'm about 0-14 doing it. Don't bet major market games. I'm not a very good major market guy. and uh, But I think negative and negative, they're going to balance each other out. Give me the <laughs> Kansas State team total under 70 and a half. I, I think, first off, if Kansas State wants to beat Kansas, it's a game we kind of discussed. Tyler Perry slows down, uh, makes this as boring a game as possible. That's the only real chance they have to win. They, Hunter Dickinson will have his way down low. Uh, Matt brings up that Kansas State has some injuries, or not 100% in the uh, in the post. And I think Hunter Dickinson is, though, a really good offensive player. We've seen that. I think that he still has a lot of room to improve on the defensive end, and this is a really good spot to do it. So I don't really think Kansas State has a ton of scores other than Cam Carter. I'm not buying Tyler Perry unless this gets into late game fouls. 
think Kansas wins pretty handily. I also think it goes under. So uh, Kansas State team total, 70 and a half. They, this is the same team that scored 52 versus Oklahoma. They scored 57 or 57 versus Oklahoma, 52 versus Houston. Like, this doesn't. This offense doesn't impress me by any means. Have we hit a live button this calendar year? I'm not sure if we have. <laughs> I, I love I love the maybe we won build one. up. Maybe one. I, maybe one. I love the build up of don't listen to me because we don't ever get this right and don't listen in a big game and then you take a big game uh, here on the live button. Um, oh, yeah. Interesting that it's a team total play for the reasons you gave. Keep the team total under for Kansas State because essentially Matt Cox, like he was talking about, if you believe that Kansas State can slow Kansas down enough to try to win the game then that's going to obviously keep their team total under. And even if you believe that they can't, Kansas may just wipe them out and they don't get to 71 anyway. That's the, I'm just going in generalities. That's kind of the theory behind the live button play. Any other thought there on Corby's live play, Matt Cox? No, I like it. I mean, the key thing for Kansas, too, is they're healthy. I think that was the concern coming into the Houston game. Kevin McCuller, a little banged up. Hunter Dickinson was also a little banged up. And McCuller's a defensive nightmare for uh, whoever else. They, want. they can throw him on Perry. They can throw him one of the other complimentary pieces. So, yeah, I think to Corby's point, I have trouble seeing how Kansas State scores um, you know, more than 65, honestly, unless the pace gets frenetically fast. But it just it hasn't so far recently, and I don't think it does in this matchup. All right, the live play is in on the Kansas State team total. You'll see that on the sheet here at the end. Time for a couple more. Uh, Easy Baby 1988 is always in here. He says, hey, what about Southern and Jackson State? Anything on that one tonight, gentlemen? I'm looking uh, there for my line in that one. You guys may have it first on the uh, on the Monday night slate. Jackson State and Southern. I'm Jackson looking. State lane one and a half, basically. Around one and a half. Is there you what, go. Yep. At Jackson State. Any thought? Uh, Jackson State hit some uh, turbulence recently. I think most people had this as the best team in the league coming into the year, even before the Deshaun Ruffin injury. Lost three in a row. Uh, now they're back home catching Southern, who's at six and two. A really good team, well coached under Kevin Johnson. I kind of lean toward Jackson State here. Just feel like a good get right spot for them at home. Uh, again, kind of basically fading these road teams and the SWAC that played two and three going from Saturday to Monday. Not all travel is the same here, but I think this is one of the tougher spots. Again, just because you have a good Mo Williams team, a dangerous Mo Williams team coming off the loss, uh, they get back on track tonight. So I would lay the uh, the short spread the short spread there with uh, the Tigers. Corby, any thought on the total, which I think I'm seeing like 144 and a half, Southern and Jackson State. Yeah, so it's been steamed up. It was 142 this morning. Uh, and I'm curious. Like, Matt knows more about the swag than I do, for sure. Um, do you take anything on Southern slowing down? So like, I was looking into this game. I, it feels like in the years past, Southern's been a team that th- kind of pushes a frenetic pace when they can. They, they'll stay in the half court when they can, but uh, I was really surprised to see how low their tempo is. Uh, this is a team that I assumed, just like from blindly watching these games in years past, that this would be an over game. Uh, but it, it kind of leans the other way. Also, Jackson State, a ton of mid-range jumpers. It's like the entire offense, basically. So I always lean towards yeah. an under there. But Southern's Southern's pace has really confused me. Yeah, I can't get a read on Kevin Johnson. Right, He's a guy who was at Tulane under Ron Hunter. So he's, I think, someone who wants to play fast. He has played fast historically. But he does mix and match defenses. Um, so you could look, it's very it's a very amorphous chameleon-type team that makes them hard to predict from a tempo perspective. Um, but also a pretty effective bet from a side perspective because you don't know what you're going to get, basically. Um, but yeah, Jackson State, key thing for them, too, just to add real quick here, Jordan O'Neill uh, did return last game. They lost two in a row without him. He's a pretty monster piece up front. Probably pays be- plays better for the under because of his rim protection ability here. So um, yeah, a lot of moving parts here. Uh, unless I have a really big edge on a total in SWAC land, I usually steer clear. I don't know if when the show began how much the savages, the peeps, thought they were going to get on Jackson State and Southern, but you just got a bunch on it in the live chat. Uh, let's continue. Core 1024 says, TJ, question, what's the best atmosphere you've done a game at? So, again, I broadcasted for the University of South Florida here in Tampa uh, for 10 years. I, I had to think about this for a couple of seconds because there have been some big ones. We used to play Louisville at Freedom Hall, the 19,000-seat barn that they used to play in. Now now it's a mausoleum where they play at the Yum Center because they don't ever win and nobody ever shows up or makes any noise. That was crazy. Did a, did a couple of games at the Carrier Dome in Syracuse with 30,000 people in the Big East. That would probably rank right up there. Did games at the Breslin Center at Michigan State. I would probably go Louisville 1, 
And now that I think about it, Breslin Center, Michigan State, with the students and all the white shirts all around the court, had about 2,000 of them right on top of us. That's all we were hearing. That atmosphere, maybe the Carrier Dome. So there's a couple of thoughts for the viewer on ones that I've been to. I have been to the Carolina Duke game. I don't know, uh, Matt or Corby, if you've ever sniffed the Carolina Duke game. I've been to that one in Cameron before, and that was bananas, and North Carolina won both times. I was there two times in three, two times in either three years or four years. Tyler Hansbro won all four times he was there. I was yeah, there for two of the Hansbro wins in the, late, uh, in the late 2000s on that. Uh, but yeah, at- atmospheres that you guys have been in. I mean, you're going to say the Bartow Arena, probably, Corby. But um, uh, atmosphere, Matty Cox. Uh, I've been to Cameron. I have not seen uh, Duke UNC, but Cameron's an all timer. I went to Indiana, so I'm biased. I think Assembly Hall's on the, Assembly the Pantheon Hall, for been. sure. Um, but objectively, I think the fog um, is the best there is. Oh. I think you saw it at its absolute and, apex. Historical yes. measures, the vibe. Yeah, it's just a good place to and go see a What game. planet are you on if you don't think, and Corby, weigh in, if you don't think that kind of environment affects the other team, like at, like at, at Fog Allen? on Saturday or at Cameron, or you don't think those Duke guys were affected down the stretch of the game at the Dean Dome when Carolina hit a couple of those big shots and the whole place erupted. Momentum, the home crowd, it can make a big difference. I mean, I watched some of the Stanford game last night with Arizona. They were right in the game. Stanford, you know, uh, playing ugly, uglied it up. And then suddenly Arizona gets a fast break dunk, gets a three. The McHale Center erupts. You can't convince me that that's not part of the equation, especially in college sports. Corby, quick thought. Yeah, I, I feel like it leans towards more overs, too. Like it, everyone, like you want to silence the crowd. You want a big play to electrocute the crowd, uh, b- both of which are, are big offensive moments. So, yeah, it's uh, I think it's a good moment or it definitely it, it, it's what make college sports what they are like pros are always going to have fans, but. Uh, I don't think ever going to be like how college fans are. Uh, as for my moment, I have none. I go to really boring games. Like UAB is probably the coolest game I go to. But hey. I will say, I will say, hey. TJ, before March Madness, I'm supposed to go to a, a Grand Canyon game. I have that in the books. All right, go so, check. Uh, That's quite excited. an environment. That'd hey, be, that Barto, go have fun at Grand Canyon. That Barto Arena was rocking for UAB and Memphis, and it affected the Memphis guys during the comeback. Oh, they're uh, for mine. UAB in that one. You got one? I got mine. All right, so for some reason, Alabama played Gonzaga in Birmingham, BJCC. Yes. Considered it, considered a neutral game, TJ. Don't understand that. That is not a neutral game. It was, uh, a, lot, it was a lot more neutral for uh, Gonzaga than it was for uh, Alabama an hour away, yeah. Yeah, and then I think, uh, oh, I was at the, so March Madness first round was Bama played somebody, and Auburn played Houston in Birmingham first round of March Madness, which yeah, last is the year. ultimate cheat code. Ultimate cheat code. That's uh, the home game for both teams. So that's uh, I don't have very many crazy ones, but that's about as far as it goes. Uh, all right, a couple more real quick. BJ watching says thoughts on Morgan State, UNC Central, North Carolina Central, Central minus five and a half. He is interested in the side. Anything on that for the viewer quickly? I like Morgan State. Got bet down to eight. I think I mentioned Morgan State last Monday as a uh, as a fade of Norfolk. I think I lost that game, um, but basically about the same price against a similarly, you know, power rating uh, competent team in NC Central. Here, I do like Morgan State. I just think you're not getting a good bargain. I mean, Kempom has his twelve. I think you've missed the value, so I'd stay away at eight. Corby, anything there? You want to move on? Quick. Yeah, NC Central is missing a player, and um, I think it's worth noting because he was a pretty good player. He scored 22 points in the game uh, versus Delaware State. But I'm curious, as I don't know how to say this guy's name, I think his name is Po' Boy, like the the sandwich. <laughs> po' Boy King. What the sandwich? You know, it is. Yeah, Po' Boy. It is. And the, well, hey, the more important personnel guy, real quick, is uh, Winston Tabs, Winnie the Pooh, as I call him. I've been a big fan of him for forever. He did not play last game for Morgan. Uh, didn't matter, as so many injuries don't. That's why I feel like I don't even match him half the time because it seems like the ones I mention don't matter and the ones I don't do, or vice versa. So, uh, but yeah, obviously, At the super risk important of player. Totally digressing. The kid's given name is pronounced Po' Boy. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm just double checking the things you find out on this show. Of course, the UAB player was a nickname, Jelly, but, uh, you know, the given name. Yeah, you gotta watch is, out for this that. This guy's legal name, Po' Boy. All right. Or so so we think. Uh, there still was a great player in, like, the early 90s, given name Scientific Map. His last name was Map, M-A-P-P, Scientific Map. Uh, that's legit. 
Uh, Helms watching. Helms 22 is interested in Bethune, Cookman, and the side. Quick take on that from either of you. Anything tonight? I've got, I got nothing there. I, uh, I looked into the stay skateboard over. away. Uh, huh? Nothing on the side. There you go. There's your stay away advice, peeps. Uh, Matthew watching says Nichols, Northwestern State. It's been a long year for Northwestern State. Any thought on Nichols uh, tonight and Northwestern State in the Southland Conference? You know, they're playing. I think they're playing better, though, TJ. And Northwestern State, four and five. I know they've lost three of their last four, but pretty impressive win um, over the weekend against AM Commerce. Now they have to go to Nichols, who's, you know, I think feisty and competent. Uh, I kind of like the number, though. Um, it's sitting at six. It's been fed down to five and a half at some places. Again, it's sort of on the edge of a value play for me. It opened at seven, so uh, nothing official for me on that one. Robert watching says, hey, TJ, what's your best bet? I don't usually go on the record. You know what my best bet is tonight? Oh, boy. Virginia and Miami is ugly. I'll do my nadu. First one to 55 wins. It's going to be ugly tonight. I think it's going to be low scoring, and that's the way Virginia wants to play. Let's see if let's see if that's uh, under. Under might be the TJ play in Virginia and Miami. Uh, for, why did you say, "Oh boy"? I mean, put it, you know, put it on the uh, put it on the sheet if it wins. It's Don't not it's it not it an loses. official. It's not. Do I have to? Oh, do I have to live play? It? Go. I'm going to live bet. <laughs> All right, I'm going to live bet Virginia Miami for the peeps. I I don't see this one getting to what is it 132 and a half? I think on the bet US line. What am I getting for my live number? I'm double checking. 132 and a half. There you go. You go to in another live button play, peeps, on the show. That's why you got to be with us. Live button is hit. You got to be with us here Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. There's another live play on the show. And when the live button gets up to 0 and 20, we're going to throw it in the dumpster. With that being said, let's take a look at what the guys are officially on. I don't think you'll see my live play added on this sheet that I just made, but you do see Corby's. All right, he took Grambling and Alcorn to score, score, score. Reminder, peeps, he hit a Grambling over last Monday night. So he, he isolates that one. Matt is on an over Eastern Washington, Portland State, the last game of the night in the big sky. Corby then live played Kansas State to be held down to under 70 and a half. You don't see it on the screen, but I will add in Virginia and Miami is low scoring suffocation like in the 50s tonight. Miami going on the road just a couple of days after they beat Virginia Tech. I don't see them scoring a lot. Virginia says, thank you. I'll live play the under. With that, final thoughts. Matt Cox, final thought before we're gone. The octagon of doom should be a fun one tonight. Uh, good luck to Kansas State. You will need it against Kansas the way they're playing right now. It will be an equalizer for a little while until Kansas starts making shots. If they do, then look out. Corby Craig, final thought before we go. Yeah, really good Tuesday slate. So be back tomorrow. Uh, exact same time. We're here every single day. We love that. Again, hit the like button. I see the live audience grew and grew over the last half hour of the show. Hit the like button. Share it out. Be here at 11 a.m. Kevin, everybody behind the scenes at BetUS. Way to rock and roll with us, especially with live buttons. Today on the program on BetUS TV. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining in. Don't forget to like our video. If you don't want to miss our next show, make sure to ring our bell and subscribe. For all our sports content, head to BetUSTV.com. See you next time.